modern jubilee. He looked like we had some really amazing speakers. We had Anne Pettifor here before she went to the Labour Assembly against austerity. Um, we had Kofi and Bernard talking about how tackling the burgeoning debt levels of the global economy now and the fundamental injustices um, that debt is causing means not just another round of debt cancellation. We definitely need another round of debt cancellation. We need to write off a lot of these unjust sovereign and household debts which are weighing people countries down. We need to go further. We need to actually tackle the fundamental way in which debt is extracting wealth from ordinary people, extracting wealth from countries, transferring wealth from the rich, sorry, from the, from the poor to the rich, and driving the further impoverishment and disempowerment of people around the world. And to do that, we need a whole set of things. We need to rein in global finance, we need to regulate the banks and the hedge funds, we need tax justice, so cracking down on tax dodging um, by multinational companies and rich individuals. Um, but we also need to, to really tackle the fundamental inequalities of wealth in the global economy, um, that inequalities between nations and inequalities between people, which are driving people and countries into indebtedness in the first place. Now, that's quite a big job. Um, and uh, it's the change that you, as we've experienced and people in the brief session just now would have, would have heard, is a change that you can't necessarily, I'm going to stand up, it's um, slightly leave it back. It's a change which is very hard to deliver in one country. It's a change which is, uh, which is sustained, which means strong, uh, coordinated movements, connected to the grassroots. Um, and this session is really about how do we build that. Obviously, not, it's not just a job for us, but we really want to understand how as debt activists and debt campaigners based here in the UK, we can really contribute to strengthening a movement that's impossible to ignore. Um, we want to look at how to build a movement that tackles the tower of the City of London and reigns in the financial sector here, but also a movement that can really exert impact and solidarity to the struggles of people around the world. Um, and there's lots of questions as part of understanding that. What kind of methods do we need? What tactics, um, what tactics which are already being used, which, what kind of tactics of campaigning and activism have been forgotten and need to be reclaimed from the past? Who do we need to be connected with? Who do we need to be able to work with um, on an ongoing way in solidarity with to build a movement which really can't be ignored? And to do that, we've got a really fantastic, really exciting about this panel actually, um, really a fantastic range of activists. Um, to start us off, we've got Dr. Marina Pintulis. Um, Marina is a senior lecturer in media and politics at the University of Anglia. She focuses on political communications, journalism, and contemporary social movements. She's involved in lots of social movements. It's a really kind of list here. Um, but she's also been the Syriza London spokesperson for the past eight months. Marina, over to you. Thank you. Again, I'm not very prepared, so I'm, I'm not sure if what I'm going to say is going to be very structured. But to start from what Sarah said, you know, first of all, in relation to that, what we are facing and what we saw in the case of Greece, for example, is that we are talking about the set of microeconomic adjustment programs that they are going to be imposed on Greece. And this is a neoliberal order that is trying to impose very specific programs. That these programs are not quite new. They have been used in other parts of the world as well. I think similar programs have been imposed in the countries of Africa. Uh, similar programs have been imposed in the countries of Latin America. What we learn from that is that despite how um, neoliberalism is quite strong and much stronger than all of us, Together, they have one uh, answer for everything, which is more neoliberalism, more austerity, more debt. And this is something that possibly we could use. On one hand, they are trying to impose these different programs, which are quite similar in different <coughs> countries, but at the core, they have only one solution. Now, in terms of the debt, and in relation to Greece, for example, where the debt is going to be the immediate cause for uh, campaigning this day, this, this, the next few months, for, possibly for Greece, the debt European countries, and, uh, I'm not only talking about the countries of the Eurozone, but the European Union as well, the debt is huge. It is part of the system to create more and more debt, and probably we will have a very serious problem at some point. So, in, in this list of countries, the European the United Kingdom has the greatest debt, 
which I think it's something like two or three years. Then it's Italy, then it's Germany, then it's France, then it's Spain, then Netherlands, then Belgium, and then it's the day of Greece. So one in that case would say, hang on a minute, so why are we talking only about the Greek debt and not the debt that it has been produced by some of the core countries? And I think the answer is because we are in a situation where we are seeing a clear division within the European U Union and Europe more generally between core and periphery. We could call, I think, this neo, the neo-colonialism uh, in a certain way. And this is, I think, the project of where the European Union is going. So we have a division between core countries and the periphery, colonized countries like Greece, but also a gap that this system is producing, as you said, between rich and poor. And this gap is becoming wider and wider uh, than uh, we, uh, we want to think about and acknowledge. So the question then, the, the next question, which is the difficult question, is how, how we deal with something like that. And here, allow me to be a little bit more abstract, because I want to talk about a strategy or uh, different tactics that they will bring all of us together. I think it's a mistake to think only of Greece as something that is happening now, there, or Portugal, or Spain. But this is our fight. It should be our common fight against the neoliberal system. So when uh, take, but uh, I start with Greece. When Greece uh, faced the huge austerity and memorandum and the debt increasing and so on, the first reaction didn't come from the top, did it, and didn't come from the left parties. It, it came from the people of Greece, very diverse groups of people, and people who, up to that point, they would even associate themselves with the conservative parties. But because the shock was so huge, these diverse people took the streets and started to protest in front of Parliament Square. A little bit, bit before that, it was the case of Spain with similar indignados protests uh, in the Plaza del Sol and, of course, in all other squares of Spain. So let's give you to where it's deserved. It wasn't the left, it was the people when their uh, uh, attachment with the neoliberal discourse started to loosen and they were totally shocked that they took the three streets and first challenged uh, this order. From there, what happened in Greece, this lasted for three or four months, is that Syriza, who didn't organize them, it was a very small party up to that point, but 4%, it started to gain from that electoral power. So some of the people that they participated there, they were looking for a different answer. Some of these demands at that point, they were expressed through Syriza, and that's how Syriza started progressively to grow in uh, terms of electoral power. But what we are look, what we see in this situation is that we're dealing with different uh, social sides. On the one hand, you have the grassroots level, and on the other hand, you have parliamentary level. And then the question for us should be this move from one side to the other, this piece from one side to the other. How can we enable it? How we can connect it? And how can we learn to work without being very much afraid on both levels at the same um, time. What happened in Greece is that then Syriza came to power, but what Syriza didn't do is turn back and reinforce and create and support a movement in the streets, which will be, uh, uh, which effectively would be the power of Syriza. So we may go from top, up, but then this should come back to the grassroots level and reinforce the grassroots level without the grassroots level, without mm -hmm. the people in the streets being there to support the, the project, nothing is going to change. And you can never have total uh, faith in what political parties are going to do. You have to be there to push them to the correct uh, direction. Uh, at the same time, another thing that we have to learn, and again, for some people it's quite difficult, is we have to learn to create alliances. We spend too much time fighting with each other, outlining our differences, bitch about it, while we are having a pint in the pub, usually, but not creating alliances. And I think the situation 
is so difficult that we have to learn to do that. If we don't really like the other people or we don't totally agree, we have to bite our lips, get together, go on, and progress. Uh, I'm saying that because always what I'm thinking is that the other side is so much better in doing that. They are not looking at their differences. They are not pinpointing to where each one of them is messing up and where they were caught for scandals and why did you do it or you didn't do it. No, they are not doing that. They have a very clear common aim. This is connecting them and it is, they are working together. So you have a neoliberal bloc which is operating across countries which is sticking together, it's very difficult to break them while we are on each other's throat. And this, I think, at some point, it has to stop. Uh, my third point, it has to do with how do you bring more people into uh, this discussion. And the concept some of us used, and another comrade from Spain came from uh, Ireland, who was using before, it was the work of Gramsci and the concept of hegemony, which which is a little bit uh, frightening <coughs> for some people. But what we, because it assumes that somebody has the power. The power, there are some people who have the power, this is in the hands of uh, the neoliberal order, and I don't mean in terms of how much um, power they have on the economic level. I mean that bottom line, they have moral and ideological leadership across Europe. Even if some people occasionally challenge them, their main ideas have become common sense. And we have to break that. We have to break what is given as a common sense understanding of economics. For example, I was saying before that um, when I was talking about series, everybody was saying, but what are you talking about? If you borrow money, you have to give the money back. It's common sense. And if you uh, <coughs> borrow a lot of money on your credit card, then you have to cut your expenses, and this is how you will move forward. Common sense logic. Bullshit when it comes to <laughs> macroeconomics. <laughs> Countries don't work in, in that way. But then you need to work on, uh, with, with the media, with the communication system, creating alternative communication pro probably in order to be able to uh, break that. Now, in relation to Greece, what happened for me and for some other people, I think, here is that we had an opening. Some of these logics, we started to question them. Syriza may have been defeated. We don't know what will happen in the future, but I think we had a great contribution in trying to change some of these uh, logics. So I think we should see the openings that we have for the past year and take advantages of that. It's not very easy. I'm talking after the attacks in Paris, which what I think is going to happen with these attacks, I think it, it has already started, is that the right wings are going to use them against uh, the refugees and they're going to close down the borders. So they already are in there and they are using this situation which had to do with these terrible attacks for their benefit, although there is no reason to believe that the refugee crisis has anything to do with that. And for some of us on the left, it has to do very much with the uh, position that Western countries had taken in terms of the war in Syria, and they have intervened, and they have polarized the situation. But I'm giving it as an example to show how they are already there, making connections that in probably a few weeks or months they are going to be seen as common sense, or oh, yeah, but with these refugees, yeah, security problems, and we are not that fast in order to attack that and say, no, this is not what is uh, happening. So, to try to sum up, I think that we have to learn to work on different levels. We have to work for each other, to expand, create a movement on the grassroots, which will involve campaigns, like the campaign that Calum is involved of the students against fees it's against the freeze, yeah? Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, which, however, they have to come together uh, and connect with a clear aim. It's not only the freeze, behind the freeze, it's a whole different system that we want to change. The good thing with these campaigns is that they translate 
the problems of the neoliberal order in something that these <coughs> groups of people can understand. Students understand that this fees and the debt that this is going to create will be unmanageable and it will be following them for the rest of their lives. There could be other campaigns. But at some point, we have to create the leaks that they will allow us to uh, expand horizontally. But at the same time, we should not be afraid to think how we are going to take power, how we are going to take power on national level, how at some point we will need to think what we are going to be do with the European Union, which I think it's not doing very well anyway, even, even internally, I mean, it, it is problematic. But we will need people in power centers that they are going to push forward either for change or for a different solution or for dissolving it or for creating something uh, different. So I will stop here horizontally and vertically at the same time, giving a little bit of uh, the, doubt, the benefit of the doubt to our comrades. And comrades, I use it and I will go on using it and I use it a little bit with for very different people that we may not have necessarily exactly the same opinion. And remember that we have to stick with each other. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rina. Um, so creating connections and alliances. There's a, um, a really good quote by the African-American singer and social activist, Bernice Johnson Reagan, which is that if you're in a coalition and it's comfortable, it's not a broad enough coalition. And I think that's something really important to learn in, in this country. Um, next up is Callum. Callum's a postgraduate student with the University of Sussex, um, and he's a committee member of the National Campaign Against Fees and Cuts, which is a grassroots student organization campaigning for free education. Um, he's been part of the free education movement for almost three years, um, and he's also written about the struggles in open democracy and the independent entity. Um, Thank you. Um, I'll just start. Uh, in uh, 1968, there was a slogan that students used, um, which was, the university is a factory, shut it down. Um, now, Joe Johnson, who's the uh, university's minister, has got his own version. Um, and his version goes, the university is a pipeline into a 21st century economy. Um, all it's missing is the shut it down. Uh, he's got this analysis, essentially, of education as being a mode of producing graduates, as producing employable commodities. I think we've got to see the fact that the, new, like, the latest conservative attacks on education are all about reorientating what education is for, and about turning us into useful graduates. Um, but then I also think that looking at the, the latest reforms in education offers us a great avenue into talking about how neoliberalism and how the conservatives in particular are interested in dealing with our society as a whole. And in fact, the way in which student debt works, I would argue, um, and it's not me that argues it first, um, there's, a, there's a person called Lazarato who writes a great book uh, called Governing by Debt, um, that university debt and student debt is paradigmatic for explaining how debt works in a neoliberal economy. So, essentially, to explain what we've seen in education for probably the past five years at least, we've seen a mass attempt at marketisation. So the introduction of triple tuition fees wasn't just about uh, changing the way universities was funded, although that is obviously a huge part of it, it was also an attempt to introduce forcibly, um, and without anyone wanting it, a market mechanism into education. Education was to be taken from being a public good into being a commodity that was to be dealt with by university businesses, by lecturers who worked as, you know, workers on a production line, and by students who are being turned rapidly into commodities themselves to be sold to employers. So that's the ideological vision behind this whole thing. Um, and recently, with the conversion of maintenance grants into maintenance loans, um, this has been accelerated by increasing the debt burden for the million poorest students, um, retrospectively changing loan conditions to make us all pay back much more than we were going to previously, um, increasing the burden, essentially, of finance upon the individual and taking education from being a, a social good funded collectively into an individual investment which you pay for yourself and you will be paying off for the next 30 years. So this in itself means that universities have changed. I've obviously been at university the last three, four years now. Um, and I was the first year of students to start with £9,000 fees. And it's remarkable the way in which students now behave so differently to what they did even when 3,000 fees were the norm. Now you see, really, people respond to their education fundamentally differently 
And I would argue that what we're actually seeing is an attempt to use universities as a way of producing nice, compliant people. This is the pipeline idea, right? We're no longer interested in critical subjects who might come out and mess things up. We need people who are ready for austerity, who are scared about the amount they owe, who are scared to go out and argue and to go out and learn things which don't have immediate economic benefit, and who are ready to go into a crap job and stay there. <laughs> yeah. That's what universities are about now. And I think this has always been what debt is about. David Harvey, who's a Marxist geographer, talks about the way in which mortgages were introduced. Um, mostly because workers with a mortgage don't want to go on strike. So this has always been the way in which capitalism and neoliberalism in particular at the moment uses debt. It's as a disciplinary tool, um, but also to economically change the relations within the university and within society as a whole. So I would say that debt is inextricable from the neoliberal economic model, um, and in particular, they want to use this debt to forcibly create markets where there aren't. In Ireland, you see the attempts to create um, a market for water. I mean, water, a basic human resource, I think that surely can't be sold as a commodity because it is so necessary to everyday life. And um, there are an attempt to prioritize water there. So this has to be seen as part of a larger ongoing social program. So then I don't think we can actually answer the question of debt, and in particular the things we do, student debt. I don't think we can answer that without having a wider analysis of what neoliberalism and austerity are trying to do to us. But the same things that are happening in Greece are happening to students in the UK. And we have to see this common struggle against debt as actually being part of a huge economic and social structure. It's not just, you know, I'm not going to be happy if we abolish student debt. I have got a, a lot of student debt, but I, don't, I wouldn't be happy if we just abolished my student debt or the student debt of all students in the UK. That's fundamentally not the point. What we need to change are the economic and social structures which impoverish us for the gain of the 1%. So for us as students, the National Campaign Against Fees and Cuts, what we do is we try and develop a campaign um, based on essentially trying to bring our collective interests to bear against those who want to attack us. So as students, we have common interests with each other. And Eventually, when we fight for what is good for us, for free education, for the abolition of student debt, for better conditions for workers at universities, when we fight for these things, we come up against a number of enemies, and primarily these enemies are the state and capital. Those are the people who really oppose us when we fight. So I think that when we're fighting for free education as a positive banner, the abolition of student debt, and against marketization, what we realize is we come up against very strong opponents. So when we have street mobilizations, there were 10,000 people, 10,000 students on the street uh, about 10 days ago. Or, or when we have a long-term strategic vision, we are always entering into contentious politics. These structures aren't just going to change because we ask nicely. Actually, conservatives don't care about us at all. They care about us, like I said, as part of a pipeline into an economy. We're on the production line. We aren't important to them. It's a sad reality, but it's true. And so. What we're talking about at the moment is a student strike. We want students to go out um, to force their national union, the National Union of Students, one of the biggest unions in Britain, to call a strike ballot so that we can voluntarily stop the education system. And when we stop the education system, when we stop universities functioning, when we learn from our comrades in Quebec, in Germany, and around the world where they have fought for free education, when we do that, the government will have to start listening because demonstrations are no longer enough. And it's no longer enough to say, you're hurting us, they don't care. Right? We have to fight back and start finding the leverage that allows us to make it so that if they keep on doing what they're doing, it will really start to make it a pain for them and our actions will start to make it a pain for them. So students will defeat this debt sentence we're being given if we find that collective strength. Um, but ultimately, and unless we, we generalise into a, a general struggle across society against austerity, against the economic regime of the 1%, we are always going to fail, and, and here I would agree entirely that we need a, a counter-hegemonic, a, a Gramscian project where we collectively argue for these ideas and build these infrastructures and fight together in coalition. Our victory against debt will not be isolated. It will be together across society, and so really I think the choice for us now, and it's a stark choice after the, next, after the last Conservative victory, is, is debt or freedom. That's really the choice we've got especially for young people going through universities, but also for people in Greece, also for people in the global south, people across the world, the choice is clear, debt or freedom. And whatever the result is, it's going to bind us all together. And so, if the choice is so stark, and if the coalitions we need to build are so broad, well then we've got nothing left to do but to get on with it, really.
Thanks, Helen. Um, next up, we've got Claire Welton. Claire's been involved in grassroots organising in London for several years on lots of different issues, um, most notably on Palestine and on girl poverty. She's recently started work for um, the community and political organising project called Take Back the City. Um, I hope you've got some leaflets in there at the back. Um, Take Back the City is meeting with hundreds of people and communities across London um, from diverse backgrounds to figure out what the demands are for the mayoral elections in 2016. Claire. Thanks. I feel really um, bad going after you two. Um, bear with me. Um, yeah, so as Sarah said, Take Back City is a kind of community organising project that also, I guess, seeks to take power. And I guess a bit like what Callum said, they don't care. Boris Johnson, you know, London is being torn apart before our eyes. And Boris Johnson is like this foppish, funny, elite man who thinks it's funny that, like, the city is being absolutely destroyed and people's lives are being made unbearable. Um, and we can't go on and we can't trust them, so what we need to do is take power. But we do need to build power in our communities first, and I think like Marina's touched on that. I think it's interesting we've got like the Corbyn movement, it's like, can you retrospectively build a movement? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that you can, but I'm, I hope to be proved wrong on that one, I guess. Um, yeah, so what Take Back the City is doing is going to communities, we're going into homeless shelters, we're going into schools and colleges, we're going into asylum seeker centres, we're going into <coughs> staff rooms, workplaces, whatever, and we're asking people, what do you want to see changed in London? Um, and then with their demands, we're putting together a People's Manifesto that we want to run in May 2016. We've got six months, it's wildly ambitious, and we need loads of money, by the way, so if anyone's got any of that, hang around, please come and grab me at the end. Um, yeah, okay, so I guess what we're doing is we're thinking about the different tactics that are necessary. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a PhD student to understand the housing crisis, you know, when your home is being taken away from you, when you can't afford the rent. That's the place to start. You start where people's issues are, not in the abstract, I would argue, actually on the real concrete issues, and you work from there. Um, also, there's a role for, you know, creative action, direct action. I'm sure that lots of people saw the Sisters Uncut demo at the Suffragette premiere, which really brought the issue of... Um, yeah, like women uh, cuts to domestic violence services into the centre. I think you have to build from that as well, but there's a massive place for creative direct action. And actually the state doesn't do that. That's something we can do. That's not something the right does either. So that is something that we have and a tool at our disposal. Um, yeah, I mean, we're getting smashed. The state is smashing us and the services are being smashed. We're not going to you know, so many of the services and the things that we rely on and people rely on to have a life that's worth living are going to be gone in five years. Lots of them are already gone. Um, I was with a friend the other week, he's like a disabled rights activist, and he's like, uh, one in five disabled people's services across the country closed last year alone. And they think it's going to be the same this year, one in five last year. Um, so we need to organise our communities because we need each other. We actually can't survive if we don't talk to each other, if we don't share resources, if we don't run our own centres, if we don't educate ourselves. Like, we're not going to survive. We have to work with each other. We have to do that at a local level. Um, we need to build power locally. Yeah, we can be more resilient um, and we're less corruptible. So, you know, let's do it. Like, I would trust any of you in this room more than I would trust David Cameron. You know, I don't, I don't even know 99% of you, but like, I know that, right? Like, actually, we are good people. And we have, we have like the right things in our, in our heart, I would say. Um, yeah, there's a role for online activism. There's a role for kind of the internet. And what is that role? Well, I would say Twitter and blogs and that kind of thing, in particular, a really good way to like raise issues and like, I, I was quite sceptical when I read a blog by a woman of colour and she was like, we don't get published in like mainstream newspapers. This is where we do get published. And this is where like we make points. And actually, um, a lot of, I would say, the kind of advancements around like transgender and understanding about transgender people in the last kind of few years has come from people using the internet to like put that out there. Um, so there's an incredibly emotionally important role for uh, online activism. But actually, it doesn't always, or most of the time, translate to like actual change in our day-to-day -day lives. So we need to kind of think about how we use the internet in an intelligent way. Use it to organise, use it to change consciousness, but not think that like doing that is, is the end. It's not. Um, yeah, I think a big thing for me is also not underestimating like how it feels to be part of a social movement. Because if it feels like rubbish, and if you like feel like you're at work, or you feel like... Um, you're unappreciated or whatever, you're not going to do it. And actually, we need to be kind to each other. I know that's a really, like, stupid, woolly liberal thing to say, but, like, we do actually need to be kind to each other. And, like, you know, neoliberalism atomizes us. It tells us that 
if I sit in front of my computer and like watch Netflix after my shit job, like maybe I'll feel okay about my life. <laughs> and actually like, you know, communities and organizing is the possibility of going out of that and actually saying, you know, like I do care about you and it's absolutely terrible that like you're not getting that appointment or you know, your home is being taken away from you. And actually like for me, like that is part of the like revolution or whatever is like we matter to each other. And that has to be said, and that has to be really well thought of. Um, I think that, uh, a, you know, a critique that I would have of movements is that they've often been dominated by like highly educated, white, able-bodied men. Um, I would say that it's really exciting in London right now to have the emergence of like black dissidents, sisters uncut, people um, organising uh, kind of, yeah, in, in a way that says actually we often felt excluded from movements before so now we're going to organise for ourselves and they're also like black dissidents are one of the best groups who who organise with others on issues they do lots of working with other people and that's like a really great thing um, and that's a lovely thing about Take Back the City is like most people in it are like young people of colour lots of them have like very working class backgrounds and they're at the heart of the project and what they've really like one thing that I've really learned from being involved is um, that we also think that there's like serious politics and serious activism which is like doing talks and sitting on panels and this is meaningful and you know actually like spoken word and music and art and performance and football that's not serious that's like silly but that is political and actually like probably songs and films have like changed people's minds and consciousness more than one million panel discussions have so we need to actually like respect and acknowledge that and work with that and the great thing about Take Back the City is like we want to take back the city politically but we want to take it back socially, we want to take it back um, you know, we want, people need to, people need places to play football, people need places to sing, people need places to organise children's centres, like all of that stuff that is part of who we are and that is, that is massively political and that's a place where we get strong and where we connect um, and we shouldn't, we need to, yeah, that's what, like living a meaningful life means. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, um, uh, yeah, I guess like, on debt, like, to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about debt, but it's bad, isn't it? It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, let's keep organising on it. Um, and I think the really good thing about JDC is, like, that it's linked to, like, churches and that kind of thing. And, like, these are the bases of power that we have that sort of are really untapped. There's like, how many people in this country go to religious places and how much political organising do we try and do in and with those places? And like, we need to, we need to, yeah, talk to those people as well, not just like talk to each other on the left, but like, there's fucking massive pools of people that we just ignore. And uh, I think it's good that JDC is linked to churches and I would encourage you, if you like, are a faith, person of faith who like goes to a place like, invite us in like we want to talk to you we want to work with you um yeah and i guess uh, i do have this thing which is like you know the world of campaigning has been like really sanitized and ngoized and stuff and like we need to resist that a bit i think i think a really great thing about julie Depp campaign is it like amplifies you know struggles from the global south and we have to do that we don't have to talk on behalf of people but we do have to echo and amplify them and i think that's like with the climate negotiations coming up in two weeks that's probably what you know western people need to be doing is amplifying the struggles on the ground where they are um i guess my final thing that i would say is like i think it's so incredibly hard to be optimistic right now like it every day just is like a world of pain when you open up Facebook or open the newspaper it's just like horrific like how is the world being run by these absolute psychopaths um yeah. like the refugee crisis like we would rather we'd rather like children drown in the sea than like open the borders like we would rather I, I just yeah I just can't comprehend it it's just absolutely devastating and I read a thing last week about the numbers of people that are killing themselves and it's a thousand more people killed themselves last year than before and that's very much linked to uh, austerity and it's just like how is how has it come to this and I think it's really hard to like not just cry and like go into yourself or like what I've had to do is just stop reading the news um but actually like maybe that means we just have to be bolder we just have to dream bigger and like I did this outreach session in this college in Walthamstone, North London, and like loads of the um, young people, like 16-year-olds in the college, didn't know university used to be free. 
So when you're saying like university should be free, like they didn't even know that they're like, well that could never happen. And I was like, that did happen. All of the people who charge you went for free, and they were like, what? So actually, like we need to, you know, we need to be bold. We need to be clear. We need to be bold. And like, I think when the cuts happened, we were like, oh please, can you not cut that or cut that? And actually, we need to be saying away with all of it. Actually, we, we want everything. We like we want it all. There's a good, good thing, just like everything for everyone. I think that's a great thing to kind of have in mind. So yeah, to, to demand more, not less, um, and and to talk to each other and to like not feel defeated. That's like we have to not feel defeated. Thanks, uh, last but definitely not least, we've got Kofi and Marili Fu. Kofi describes himself um, as a grassroots academy, commons, scholar, activist, jurist, consult. Kofi is devoted to Pan-African internationalist advocacy for global justice through various organisations and networks. It's mainly through Pan-Afrodaba, which is a grassroots African community advocacy research think tank. But he's also a co-founder, um, excitingly, of the All African Networking Community Link for International Development, which we're trying to really strengthen connections with the GB Debt campaign um, as a space for a real dialogue um, with the African heritage, heritage community in this country. Kofi. How do we build a movement that's impossible to ignore. In my view, it is building ground up a social movement of globally interconnected people's power for global justice. What do I mean by that? I've lived in this country for at least two decades. <coughs> And one of the things that strikes me is the increasing isolation of our communities from each other. And the activism that more and more people are compelled in their communities to engage in, in defense of what the state is increasingly being used to take away from us, you know, into um, the hands of private, you know, uh, profiteering predators. We are actually defeating our efforts by doing so in isolation. And that is why hearing what has been said from here is encouraging. But I've heard a lot of that kind of talk before. But people say what they know is the reasonable thing to do and leave the platform and do exactly the opposite. You know? And um, that is the major weakness we have. Our movement is weakened by our fragmentation of the movement and inability to connect. So for me, how we do it is, first of all, organizing locally. Localization should be the opposite to the kind of neoliberal globalization that capital is imposing on the world, which means we organize locally in order to reach to everybody globally. That also means that we have to listen to each other, listen to our communities. One of the biggest things that lies that some of some of us still keep, you know, perpetrating is that they are voiceless. Nobody is voiceless. Even those who are not able to express themselves, you know, in words. And in Africa, we're trained to understand, first and foremost, our body languages. And a lot of our parents bring us up with body language. Okay? So people, everybody has their voice. But we sometimes choose to ignore other voices. And privilege our own over others. So we must learn to listen to each other. 
And in order to listen, we should encourage each other to speak our minds and our hearts out, in all honesty. And then from there, seek grounds of working together, right? And take joint action. So cross-community education, interconnection, for joint global justice action is what we should be doing. <coughs> we, in the Pan-African Reparations for Global Justice Movement, raise a project of what we call Ubuntu People to People's Internationalist Solidarity and Ground Up diplomacy work. <laughs> Ubuntu is essential to us as a major principle of reparatory justice. Why? Because as African people, we cannot comprehend and express our humanity except through other people. <coughs> That is fundamentally what we believe in. So our humanity is not expressed in the kind of relations we build with others across the world, then it means absolutely nothing to us. And therefore, in trying to overcome in our way of expressing that humanity, it is in our interest to ensure that whatever we do with others, the kind of relationship we build with, we build with others, expresses our common humanity. Unfortunately, particularly in so-called left circles, this is not what you see in reality. There's a lot of talk about internationalism. But it means absolutely very little, even in the conceptions of projects of emancipation. For me, the problem with some change-making projects, whether they are considered at national or local level, and Greece for me is a good example of that, is when you conceive of a project of emancipation as just a national project, then yourself against global capital, you will lose. Why is it that the austerity movement in Europe still is refusing, and that is a fact, to connect with those whom Europe for centuries has been imposing austerity? <coughs> Why? Because there is a certain colonial mentality, particularly amongst the left in Europe, that anything they wake up to, they've discovered it first, then they have to go around the world teaching everybody, you know, their view of it. Right? So, the huge experiences that the majority of the peoples of the world, who for decades have had European power impose austerity upon them, those experiences of resistance and the successes and failures, the lessons of the success and failures of that resistance, the European anti-austerity movement is not paying much attention to that today. <coughs> and therefore we see what has happened in Greece, you know, and what will be the, the, the prospects for the anti-austerity movement in, in everywhere else in Europe if they refuse to ignore that the majority of humanity already has accumulated, you know, fighting freedom, fighting experience in tackling austerity. And that is why Ubuntu is again essential in this, because yes, communities, particularly of colonized peoples, have always had to respond in terms of repar reparations and reparations just beginning with their community self-repairs, holding themselves together and trying to repair the damages that colonization continues to inflict. You know, so today more than ever before, 
we need to return to one of the cardinal principles raised by the Black Panthers. Intercommunalism. Not in the negative sense in which it's seen, but in terms of put, you know, regenerating our communities of resistance and connecting them as the fighting force against globalizing capital. Because our battle against globalizing capital has to be one of preserving community and, main, and trying to recover from them what capital has taken into a community commons. And without the concept of a community commons, globalizing it, we stand no chance. Because we are doomed to repeating even in the methods in which we organize and the way we relate to each, we relate to each other, the, the, the bad practices of you know, uh, 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 capitalism. That is the fact, and that keeps us away from each other, okay? So these, for me, are the key things. There is a lot more that can be said to unpack this. Because at the end of the day, we have to take responsibility in our communities in terms of the interconnectedness of our struggle. When I go and in, in, in back to work in my African heritage communities here in this country and outside, the first challenge I face and have to stand up to as somebody who believes in people coming together to make change is the, 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 the chauvinism that gets expressed in certain sectors of our community in terms of activism. I can pander to it you know, in order to win some cheap popularity, right? But I know that it is a slippery road to defeating everything we say we are fighting for. And that is why I urge all of us, in terms of doing community organizing, which is the key now to building up people's power against globalizing capital, we must also stand up to the backward elements in our community that want to say, let's fight alone because we are different from everybody else. Yet there are differences in our project, historical trajectory. We have more in common than what should be dividing us. And we should engage in honest dialogue about the differences so as to even understand what they have and what we're doing about them. Lastly, I want to say for me, the success of the, the, the yardstick for measuring, the success of a movement for change ought to be what? Old fashioned idea of love. <laughs> One love as Bob Marley put it. But it's not only Bob Marley. The icons of the great of the great religions of the world, what do they prioritize about everything else, even their religious doctrines? Love. And having been brought up with a colonial experience of Christianity, I know that Jesus himself, that's what I was told, said, above everything else, we stand for love. And you know, interestingly, the early Christians were distinguished as a community from all of this by the love not only for themselves but for people, for humanity. And until we build a movement, a local movement for global justice, that each and every people on this planet, no matter what differences they have with that movement, can see it distinguish itself by the kind of love shared with what I was talking about, our movement will go nowhere. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Moin Yassin from Global Vision 2000. Just a couple of points, suggestions. Um, firstly, I agree with what everyone said. I don't usually say that from the panel, but I've been here, which is great. Uh, so, um, but a couple of points. Um, I think we all need to look in the mirror. I, I believe actually the new generation, young people, are the future. Uh, I, I don't just mean the future, but in terms of leadership, uh, because they're really being crushed by this neoliberal uh, debt-based usurious system and other sections of the community, no doubt, but definitely in terms of change, we've got to put young people up uh, in front there. Uh, first point. Uh, secondly, um, money, yes. Um, debt. Um, I, I think we, it's a pity we, we've not had a Muslim speaker here because in the judo uh, Christian Islamic tradition we've pioneered at events in Parliament too, is Islam does not view money as a commodity historically. So <clears throat> if you're really going to deal with the issue of debt here, yeah? <clears throat> debt and a debt, uh, a, a debt based financial usurious system, you're missing out one in four of humanity who would be prepared ideologically not to deal with banks, if you follow, follow what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> so you're missing out a huge potential alliance. And that's why Muslims are being demonized and terrorized. Because those at the top of the system <coughs> view the Islamic solution of debt-based financial usurious capitalism as anathema. No wonder Islam is being tarnished deliberately with a brush of terror. And it's very deep rooted. Um, so uh, in terms of solutions, I think we need to go beyond debt. It's okay saying cancel debt, but how do you do that? I think we should really, you know, focus on that. Um, and, um, uh, I, you know, this, just this week, the Bank of England governor, uh, Carney, who caused a housing crisis actually in Canada, claimed the age of uh, banking irresponsibility is over. So the, pro the problem is we need to, I'm sorry to use this language, it is a battle, there are enemies. We need to identify who is this 1%. It's great that Vegas think tanks have moved the debate to the 1%, but it's not enough. Because with due respect, there are certain individuals, and we can name them, it's all on the internet now, uh, including banking dynasties, for instance, who use, um, for instance, I'll mention the organization, there's no point hiding these things, who use secrecy to um, subvert the public system. For instance, Masonic movement. So we're all in the dark. Now this is a very important issue. You not, might not agree with it, but you need to do your homework. The way the system uses deceit um, makes the battle difficult. And finally, we should aim at a trusty people's, people's economy based on trusteeship and not just cancellation of debt. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to accept Marina's invitation to do a comradely uncomfortable discussion <laughs> and maybe take it one step further to do a comradely heckling, um, if that's possible and allowed, um, for both Marina and for Sarah. 
Um, I think, Marina, you gave some very interesting um, overview of some of the lessons in Greece and some of the experiences in Greece. But I think there's an important question to ask now, what will Syriza do following the bailout? And very concretely, I would like to ask, will Syriza be pushed into administering repression and potentially a bloodbath in the face of um, very likely resistance that may include rioting, may include strikes, may include occupations? And my heckling for Sarah, as um, Jubilee, Sal, uh, Jubilee um, that campaign um, for organizing this event, what are your motives for inviting Sarisa at this stage? Is it to learn from their experiences, which I think is a very valuable experience that we can all learn from, or is it to support them now in government, which I think may be quite problematic, so I'd like to ask that. I hope that's acceptable as commonly heckling. Thanks. I think slogans are really useful uh, for rallying people and we need to rally people in order to get a really uh, big movement going and I'd like to endorse the one that we heard from a uh, student earlier on, debt or freedom, I think is a brilliant slogan and I think we'd unite a lot of people because debt obviously um, has a real meaning for students but it also has a real meaning there's so many people in society, as we've heard today, the levels of personal debt are huge. So I'd just like to put that forward. Just to add to what uh, my comrade said here a few minutes ago, uh, and to pick up on what you're saying about the grass movement um, getting out on the streets in Greece, there has actually been a general strike, <laughs> I believe, in the last week or two hasn't made it to the media here, but people have been out on the streets, general strike, and that, of course, is against the government of Syriza. Uh, hi. Um, sometimes I think all of this won't work until those who are over 60 actually march, or do more than march, in the streets especially those who are pensioners, who have lots of time in their hands, and perhaps yeah. the whom <laughs> three months inside from a magistrate, they might just touch their chin and say, mm, a new experience. <laughs> but yeah, I, I am serious. Perhaps this won't work until, the same way as how we are reaching out here, we do get the older people on board. And remember, they have virtually nothing to lose. Their pensions are already secure. And much as we think that they are comfortable and won't march, I think the truth. I think I tend to agree with what Marina said uh, that. Um, until a common sense narrative is developed, um, all human beings and their core are fair and just. You have seen people march out for you know, war against Iraq and for all, all various reasons when, when they're called on. But it's never sustainable and it's never sustained because there is no common sense narrative um, you know, which, which, which binds all the various flowers into, into a bouquet. Um, so, you know, we, we need to have a common sense narrative against debt, that debt on your own self and living in debt and uh, you know providing debt to other people and exploiting them it does not make sense. It does not make sense for one's own good. And until that common sense narrative is developed, the, you know one will always tend to stay in the fringes, not become main movement which 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 hits um, the core of every everybody's heart and gets them out of their sofas in one or another and take actions. Thank you. Um, I would want to um, probably amend the slogan to be more of a freedom or 
social debt in debt. Because for me, I've been in this country and seen a lot of people revel in debt. Right? You know, I mean, paying things they can't afford with credit cards and so on and so forth. You know, and just working themselves to death, literally, to keep paying. And they feel comfortable about it. Right? But I know that in other parts of the world, in most parts of the world, people, you know, cannot afford to do that. Right? So I don't think that, you know, that kind of thing will work on the mind of the majority of people in this country who up to doing go into the shops and see that the shop shopping spree for Christmas. Right? People revel in being in debt because it doesn't particularly affect them in any major way. So I, I in this part of the world. So I think that you know, whatever we come up with, one thing we must be very, very clear about, that if it does not shock the majority of people out of the complacency of neoliberal capitalist consumerist living to want to do something, then it will still be the small group of people, you know, who will be marching and, 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 and shouting and not much of a movement against the predators will happen. And I think the real challenge for people in Europe is whether they want to, at this point in time, rise up in their, in, 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 in their millions alongside people who are rising up in South Africa today, who are rising up in Colombia today, who are rising up you know, in various parts of Asia today, whether they want to be out there on the street, not for a few hours of marching to go back home and drink coffee, but to stay on the streets until these kind of regimes you democratically elect. You know, you do what they pay others to do in other parts of the world where they stay. They pay them to stay on the streets until regime change occurs. Then this movement they go out, stay on the streets until the lives of Cameron fall. That will be the test of the movement in this part of the world. <coughs> um, just to respond to the question of, um, of what words do we use to propose our ideal, um, I think really what, what this is asking is kind of what's our utopia, right? Like that seems to be the question behind this. Like if we're proposing a positive vision for the world, how do we communicate it? Um, and this is obviously like there's a long history of people using words, right? Ever since I think it's uh, 1498, you get Thomas Munzer, who's uh, a monk in the Peasants' Revolt, saying, Omnia sunt communia, um, which is everything for every, everyone, as was referenced earlier. Um, I think that's a good way of saying it, everything for everyone. But also, I think we really have to deal with the fact that there's a tradition that kind of misuses our name, right? In that my ideal, certainly, is something along the lines of communism, in the sense of everyone sharing, producing for each other, controlling society together, uh, like genuine economic democracy. Um, but I think the question of what words do we use and how do we communicate a positive vision is also a question of how do we deal with the legacy of, of people who have had a, apparently the same ideology but done horrendous things. Um, so really I think that the question of, of how do we propose our utopia and how do we propose our positive vision, do we use socialism, do we use communism, do we use what next? is an important one. Um, I'm not one who believes in inventing random words and pretending you're from a different tradition than you are. Though. And so for me, I guess, ultimately proposing my vision is unpopular. People don't like it when you say it. But I, I do think there's something to be said for saying that, you know, I go, I go, I'm a Marxist, I go back to that tradition, you know, I, I think the Communist Manifesto is great, I'm a communist. I don't have loads to say. I guess there's a couple of things about like generational stuff which maybe I'll pick up on. Which I think is like we don't do intergenerational organising, to my mind. I think part of that is actually when you look at a group, it's like there's no if there is no one who's been in the group longer than two years, you have to ask yourself why that is. Like why why are the ways in which you're organising leave mean that when people have children or when their parent gets ill or whatever, they go. And actually like we need to support each other to stay because we need like I could really do with like people that have been in the organising game for 40 years to pass on some of their tips. So yeah, let's do that. And I think like Take Back the City is primarily young people, but it's it's for everyone. So I'd say definitely if you're interested, get involved. Yeah. <laughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 
uh, in relation to the question about something different than growth. This exists. It is out there. There are economists who are working with it. And for, I hope that these economists are going to have more influence. So they are talking about the growth. That's the word which is the opposite of growth. <coughs> so they are trying to push the idea that growth cannot go on forever and ever and ever and we grow. But I, I was discussing that in the previous panel. The problem there is how do you communicate this idea of the growth? So my experience is that what I was trying to explain all this previous time about austerity is that austerity is not going to create growth. If you want growth, you have to invest. So you see, in, in terms of the language I'm using, is that I'm trying to a little bit change from austerity to investment because this is going to bring growth. And this was quite communicable. Now, the degrowth uh, as a, a concept for a large public is mu much more difficult. Nevertheless, there are people who are working with that theoretically, and there are people who are working with that on a more grassroots level, creating alternative economic models and trying to rethink on a local scale what that means. In, what, what that means in Greece is that after the crisis, there were a lot of solidarity networks that, again, they were bringing in some old ideas and a new take, like cooperation and how do we deal without money and how can we have an exchange economy, can we have eco-friendly communities, what would that mean? It's a need, there is an interesting film on that. It, well, it's not exciting as a film, it's different interviews and examples of different um, attempts to create a different different economic models, different communities, put the whole grassroots in a different logic. It's called Another World. It exists on YouTube. I just sent a message to, to the that campaign, direct message, and to Jonathan. Is Jonathan here? Is he here? Yeah. <laughs> So if, if Jonathan and if, if Jonathan, I've sent you a direct message on Twitter. Can you retweet it? Or can, I don't, I'm not very good with technology. What does it say? <laughs> it says that alternative economic models and it gives a link. Because it does exist on YouTube and it is closer to see what people on the grassroots of Greece were trying uh, to do. In terms of Syriza, I have to reintroduce myself. I don't work for the government. <laughs> they are not paid. And they haven't taken a Masonic oath of total and absolute <laughs> you know, uh, compliance with the party line. Or in, in that case, it's not even the party line. It's, it's the government, actually. So I don't know what it will happen in the future. And of course, as it is right now, Syriza is trying to do something, it's questionable again how much you can do in order to protect lower and middle incomes. If this is possible, again, it's under question mark. And a lot of us, we don't know what is going to happen in the future. In 2008, for a different reason, it didn't have to do with the economy, the whole Athens was burning because the police killed a, a young uh, anarchist. Uh, that may happen, again. But the question is not that and what Syriza is going to do and things like that. The question is, how, if there is a situation like that, what is our proposal? What is our role there? I'm, I'm not talking about the government role. I, I'm talking about my role as an activist who wants to see change, and it's not paid by Syriza. I'm talking about people who would like to have seen Syriza doing something, winning. But as I said before, winning is not that easy. Uh, but, but if, let's say, there is this case, how do you intervene there? What are you going to do? Uh, in, so I'm not sure what Syriza is going to do. Syriza is in the government, and the party is playing a much less important role in the government. So um, we have to differentiate between these different uh, levels as well. You have the Syriza activists who are members of the party, but then you, you have the government, and don't assume that the, necessarily there is the one and um, the same thing there. But when people say that, oh, Syriza should have won, or why are you inviting Syriza? I think one answer it could be the experience. The other is that some of us, we've been activists for much longer, and we haven't only been working in Syriza and with Syriza and so on. The question is, why people in Britain ask this question quite often? 
So, on a comparable way, <laughs> I've been standing back. It's 2015. You had governments in Britain that they were conservative, governments that they were a little bit socialist, some that they were more socialist, and probably in the future some that they will be totally socialist. So, what are you going to do with the Queen? It's 2015. <laughs> 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 God save the Queen. Sorry? God save the Queen. I cannot deal with this idea. As a Greek, I, I find it amazingly peculiar that there is still a Queen and we play with that. You know? <laughs> um, no, the other thing is that I, I talked about, and, and the other speakers talk about connecting and to working together, but we have to understand also the difference that they come with that. And what I find, and what I want to think, for example, in relation to that, is something that I mentioned, and you just said. This has been going on, and they have been imposing this logic for many, 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 many years on Africa, on Latin America. It's just that now that it's imposed on us, that we freaked out. Yeah. So we have to learn from these other experiences. What I also find quite comfortable is when I talk with people in Latin America because they tried to fight it back, they created the governments, and it's not, again, that easy. They understand what it means to feed, they understand how difficult it is, they understand that you cannot take over the state or the old structures that easily. So please, let's keep that in mind. I cannot talk about love the same way <laughs> to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but let's approach each other with some some respect and respect to their experiences as well. Thanks, Rina. Um, yeah, maybe just to pick up on Collier's quip and um, responding to that question is Julie Deckham. We didn't invite Susan, we invited Marina. Um, uh, we work with diversity of, um, of activists within Greece who are fighting austerity and, and fighting the injustices of the debt. Um, but also I think it's really important that um, we recognise that this is a big fight and it's going to take a lot of failed experiments and we can't push people away if the party they're connected to um, um, failed this time. The European austerity movement has had an amazing learning because of what has happened in Greece this year. We've really realised the extent to which the European Commission and the Troika are prepared to use their power to actually shut down the Greek banks in order to, to get what they want and impose the, the third memorandum. Um, and that has been very significant in terms of understanding how we need a pan-European movement, a global movement that connects, and as Kofi said, brings in all the learnings from the decades of fighting against austerity that people in the global south have been experiencing. Um, I think there's nothing left to say really, um, except to... Can I add something? Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a great difficulty with new technologies. We understand that we are a different generation than our statement, but we did retweet the link for that uh, film. Jonathan did it, I did it. I'm not sure what's the best way to do it. To believe that campaign? Hang on. So did we do it correct? Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's on, if you go on Twitter, the handle is at drop the debt, and then there's the link there. And I, I am my surname. I don't know that's the name. Yeah, that's on there. Okay, um, uh, there's a couple of things I need to, I need to tell you before um, we wrap up. Uh, first of all, there are only, I mean, we've had quite a lot of shout outs. There's loads of organisations that have participated um, and helped make this happen, um, and I hope that you'll pick up all of their literature um, and also look at their websites. Um, are there any events or, or chat ups that people want to do? Um, I've got I've got one which is from Anna Lau who was going to be presenting in the reparation session but couldn't make it. Um, it's a session called Arteries Repairs, which is on the 25th of November. It's
Um, I want to thank everyone so much for coming. Um, we're really committed to this. This Jubilee Debt Campaign has a very rich list of ideas which came out um, of this panel. Uh, building a broad, connected coalition, creating direct action, organising in our communities, amplifying voices that are not heard um, and being kind. There's a lot of prefigurative politics in there. Um, really thank you for coming and making this such a rich day. Thank all of our speakers. Thanks to Jonathan, who's once again hiding at the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and to Charlie, um, to our volunteers, to Paul and Anissa, to Cal and Jose for the filming, the amazing set of Luke Star, um, and yeah, most importantly to you. So thanks a lot, and we hope you'll continue on this journey with us to victory. Thank you.